for today, we have Sean Rowe, who's going to talk to us a little bit about his work that he's been doing for, I did not know, 15 years out in the visitor center looking at how individuals and groups um, process and think and learn about the information that's presented. Um, and so Sean is an associate professor with um, Oregon Sea Grant Extension Program and OSU's College of Education. Um, and he is stationed here. And with that, I'm just going to hand it over and let Sean take the show. Thank you. Hey everybody, I know a lot of people here and I don't know some people here, which is always cool and great. <laughs> Since they can't see me online anyway, it's okay with the dark. <laughs> don't fall asleep. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the last 15 years of research, so you're in luck in that regard. Uh, I am going to talk about, so for the last, how many of you know about our Cyber Lab project? You know, so Going next. So I will talk briefly about the Cyber Lab just to keep get everybody up to speed on that. Kind of what we learned from that, the promise and realities. I almost called it the promise and perils, uh, but uh, a little bit of the promise, a little bit about the realities, and then what we have done since and where we're going based on that, what we learned from that very large effort of which several people in here were a very big part uh, and are ruining that day probably. I came here 15 years ago to do this, uh, to advance the art and science of free choice learning. Uh, free choice learning is the notion that, uh, well, it's this. Uh, most of the time that we spend learning isn't spent in classrooms or seminars or lectures or even from experts. It's spent in everyday context of our life because most of our life is spent in the everyday context of our life rather than formal schooling. Uh, when you try to actually analyze this and break it down, quantify learning, which is actually a very difficult thing to quantify, as you can imagine, uh, it sort of looks like this. Somewhere between 69 and 90 percent of your life is spent outside of formal education. I know it doesn't seem like that for most of you in the room, but that is in fact the case. And it, strikingly, most of what people know, and this is reinforced to me all the time, I know it theoretically, but it just gets reinforced every time I walk out in the visitor center, every time I give a talk and ask the question, where did you come to care about the ocean or learn what you know about the ocean? Most people don't learn it in school. Most people don't learn it at the university. Most people learn it from visiting places like Hatfield, on vacation, at the beach, uh, fishing, hunting, being out in nature with their friends, family, watching TV, and Google. So that's where we learn. And our job here for the last 15 years has really been about that. Um, we, when, I, when I came here, that was kind of the idea was that we would reimagine the work in the visitor center and the marine education program uh, with families and youth as research labs. Uh, and so, and that really, everybody here took that really seriously and kind of embraced it, and we really did it. Uh, we kind of started small. We had a $5,000 HALT award to study sea otter and to study what people in Oregon understood about population dynamics of sea otter and research on that, uh, from which we built an exhibit and did a bunch of research. Uh, that expanded kind of exponentially over the years. Uh, and the biggest piece of that, well, and I should actually point to this, most of which has been done by these 52 graduate students who have been in and out of the lab and out of the uh, uh, field out here and their publications as well as ours, other ones. We started like this, walking around the visitor center. We call it lurking or stalking visitors. Uh, this is Bill Hitchmaker uh, lurking. <laughs> this is uh, Alicia Christensen, a marine resource management student lurking. Uh, these are tracks of visitors moving through. This is a data sheet. This is literally standing there for hours with a time a, time, uh, a stopwatch and a piece of paper and counting everything. Um, that was great. We learned a lot. We, we did a lot of cool work like that. Uh, but then we got a bunch of money, uh, thanks partially to the National Science Foundation and partially to Mark 
Farley uh, and his outrageous idea for how to do this. Uh, and so from 2011 to 2018, sorry, the last seven years or so, uh, we basically amped up the game by installing a very large set of surveillance cameras, microphones, and audio capture, face recognition, and keyboard stroke recorders across the visitor center. We built new exhibits, we wired the exhibits, and we started recording everything that everybody did in the visitor center all the time. Uh, the promise of this, the reason NSF thought that we weren't, well, maybe they did think we were insane now that I think about it, because, <laughs> uh, but uh, the reason they funded us was because of the promise that, that we could do this kind of, we could create these large data sets in a relatively fast and painless manner with smaller person time effort uh, that would address these kind of large field-wide issues in learning sciences and informal learning sciences. Um, the issues particularly that have to do with sample size. So most of the work in our field is done with groups of 15 or 20 people, or 15 or 20 groups often. 100 people is a pretty big sample in some cases, 120 people. Uh, and so this would allow you to sort of speak to, to greater numbers with things like, I was just looking at a piece of data that we have from the other day with 8,200 uh, individuals in it. Uh, that's from six days of data collection. Uh, so we could literally do this in, in, in real time and really quickly while still maintaining the possibility of this really fine-grained analysis of interaction, like how long does somebody spend uh, making eye contact with their learning partner in an interaction? How much time does a docent spend waiting before they give the answer? Uh, we can literally track all that stuff still, uh, which is super important. Um, all of you experienced that in one way or another. This is what it looked like at its height. Uh, this is what my desktop looked like at its height. Uh, these are the feeds from 40 surveillance cameras on all the time. Where it's green shows that something's being recorded on that camera. Uh, and where it's uh, red means the camera's dead. Uh, and where it's black, like at night, nothing's being recorded. 64 terabytes of data every 20 days. Um, it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, the 40 camera system, though, really allowed us to get both a large, gross kind of level scale understanding of how people move through the vision center and work with it, as well as identify kind of key hotspots and interesting places to look at depth. <clears throat> the realities of that, and I've talked about some of the findings from this work here before with you or with some of you. Uh, the realities were that this really, if you think about the cost-benefit ratio, uh, the benefit to research was amazing. Uh, there really is true benefit to doing this, to installing a camera system throughout a, a museum or throughout a learning uh, environment uh, in such a way that it does not interfere with the learning experience, uh, doesn't get in the way of learners on their leisure time doing things, uh, and doesn't require a researcher to be standing there all the time. Uh, we really did do faster, quicker design, prototyping, research. Uh, we could carry out and disseminate. We, 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 we shrunk the time that it takes to go from kind of imagining a, a project to publishing a project from sometimes 18 to 24 months to about 6 to 12 months. So it really did make a difference uh, in terms of how we think about and do research on the floor in the museum. Um, but. Uh, and this is something we hit every year of the seven years. The field of informal STEM education, which is where I, which is really where we work, right, uh, just isn't ready to use data in the quantities or quality that we produced. Uh, we brought in researchers from around the world over and over again. We trained them. We gave them. We, we did a one week uh, uh, research intensive Ignite program with a bunch of them. Uh, in the hopes that they would that they would embrace the kind of computational thinking and the the skills that were necessary to really imagine doing research in our site with this kind of data, and it just never came to fruition. It really was hard uh, to create the culture shift that's necessary. And I think that's what we identified. That it's not simply a matter of people knowing better statistical skills or computational thinking or even just big data analysis kind of mindset. It's really a whole culture shift uh, that that we weren't. We weren't prepared or funded to make happen. Um, at the, 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 the second reality is that the payoff, this, is a, this was a, a big investment of money, but the payoff for the everyday work of the museum just isn't there, right? The payoff for research is high. The 
payoff for the museum itself is kind of low. Uh, we were able to produce a lot of great things for evaluation purposes, assessment purposes, and just our daily operations purposes. But we could have done all that with a well-positioned intern during the year, right? Uh, so the, 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 the I mean, we get bigger numbers. So we can be a little more sure. But we didn't need bigger numbers for most of those kinds of things. To know where people are going in the museum, you can just you can literally just have people stand out there and look for a little bit and give you an answer that get the same answer from the data set. Um, and then lastly, and I think this is kind of the, the real kicker, uh, the infrastructure and technical support costs uh, are just simply too high for most museums, for most public museums, and certainly for a museum our size, given the university's relatively meager investment in, in public education in what Mark calls running a Dairy Queen. Uh, keeping the door open. Um, specifically the IT cost, but also exhibit tech because we built, exhibits had to be built to promote research and to include the wire up and the video. Uh, and then you, you, the licensing fees for the work were enormous, uh, as were the, uh, the analysis costs. Yes. Oh, I thought you had a question. Sorry. If you have a question, please jump in. I do not mind stopping along the way. <clears throat> so, in 2018, 17, 18, uh, we, we, seeing where this was going, <laughs> basically, uh, we made the strategic decision to try something new, which was to create a mobile cyber lab, uh, which we did. Here it is. This is not it. This is just cool. Uh, here it is. It's a mobile cyber lab. Um, there are now four of them, I think. Uh, uh, in, in existence, more or less. The back end, of course, is not here. The giant server rack in my office is in, in the picture. That's kind of the, the, the hardcore back end. But this allows you to go out and do the same kinds of research in situ anywhere. And so for the last, well, since 2017, this is what we've been doing and trying out in various ways. Uh, mobility has meant new partners and new opportunities. Uh, specifically uh, in some areas that are really interesting and problematic for researching, uh, but that, that really have, um, can really tell us a lot. One of our big partners is the CO. This is the Corvallis Maker Fair. This is the Community University Partnership in Corvallis and the Willamette Valley that promotes making as a, uh, as a, uh, as a lifelong learning and empowerment uh, kind of context. This is the Maker Fair on campus in the bottom of the MU and all the vendors set up. This is something that would get three to 5,000 people moving through from 10 to 2 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. And this is uh, one of us hanging a research camera in there to capture this exact view. And then what's happened is we've marked it off for data collection so that we can try to collect video and audio in a, uh, in a, in a pop-up museum kind of context in, instead of a a permanent museum kind of context. Our second big uh, um, partner is the, is the Brazilian Ministry of Health, and in particular the uh, Fiocruz, which is the, uh, basically the, the premier health sciences university of uh, Brazil in Rio de Janeiro. They also run a museum on site, uh, Museo da Vida, and we've been doing research there for the last four years using mobile camera setups. Uh, and various kinds of analysis techniques that came out of the cyber lab. Um, I'm actually going to talk about some of the findings from that. And then the, another big partner is Red Pop. Uh, uh, Red Pop, not the soft drink, is a, um, uh, is a committee for the popularization of science in Latin America and the Caribbean. So this is a, it's an international group made up of representatives uh, from the informal science or science communication realms. In, uh, in all of the countries of Central, South America, and the Caribbean. And so these partnerships have, are where we've really put our effort in the last several years and our mo mobility. So that's what I'm going to talk about, kind of what's, where that's going. OK, any questions so far? Great. One of the things that we learned from the Cyber Lab uh, and I've talked about various parts of this in various ways here, and they're published out in various places, is that exhibits promote learning when they do these things, right? So if you really want an exhibit to work, you have to design these things in. It has to encourage collaboration. 
head down one person at a time at an exhibit doesn't promote learning. You know, we, we think about that as how we do homework. It's not actually a very good learning context. Uh, an exhibit promotes learning when it allows for multiple users simultaneously to interact collaboratively, because you can't collaborate if you can't get in there together at the same time. And I, in a kind of funny way, promoting eye contact, I mentioned that earlier, if people can't see what the other person's doing or thinking or talking about, they also don't collaborate very well and they don't learn very well. So when people have to stand like this next to each other in an exhibit, or like sit like you are right now, it's not actually not very promotive of learning. It doesn't promote conversation, doesn't promote interaction, doesn't promote learning. Um, this one's a little more interesting, allowing for multiple outcomes. The problem with science education in general is that we know what the answer should be and where we want people to get, but as soon as we sort of prescribe that, learning stops. <laughs> so creating experiences where there are multiple correct possible outcomes is really important and exhibits succeed when that happens. And then when they combine the everyday with the scientific, we also, when we work with scientists, often scientists are concerned about working with public audiences because they don't want to dumb down the science. The big news that we have shown over and over again, I think, in, with cyber lab data and other kinds of data, is that the public's also get offended when you dumb down science. They don't want that. They want to engage in real science, real thinking, but you got to engage in everyday ways of talking and thinking in order to create the hybrid kind of conversations that promote learning. Uh, and then uh, this is something that came out of uh, Susan's work. Susan did her dissertation using cyber lab uh, kind of equipment and uh, methodologies at the touch tanks out here in the visitor center. Uh, visitors want you to engage with their values and worldviews, not their science knowledge solely. And this makes all of us, scientists, educators, museum designers, really nervous. Because as soon as you start talking to people about their values and worldviews, you're having a real genuine conversation with them and you can't be really you can't direct that very well <laughs> in any kind of meaningful way and so you're sort of opening the door to a lot of a lot period and but it works as soon as you do this people are willing to engage they're willing to argue they're willing to harness evidence for their arguments they're willing to do observation they're willing to do scientific reasoning and thinking the kind that you would want them to be doing toward, hopefully, the goals that you have. We package this up in the work we're doing in, uh, now into this notion of what we call protagonism. And we call it protagonism, which is a lousy English word, but is a phenomenal Portuguese word. So in Brazil, uh, uh, protagonismo uh, is a really great term. And it's very sensible to everybody. And I have to explain it to everybody in English. Uh, a protagonist of a story, the hero, the person who undergoes a transformation in a, in a, in a narrative, that's, what, that's the person we're talking about. And we are imagining learners in this kind of terminology as the protagonist of their own learning, which decenters the teacher, decenters authority for learning, and places autonomy, basically, for learning with the learner. Now, this is something that is absolutely typical of education theory and research over the last 20 years in classrooms, especially middle school and high school classrooms, is not very typical of higher education, although we see a lot more of that going that way. And it's something that a lot of lip service has been given to in museums and other informal learning environments, but hasn't really been treated seriously from a research perspective, I don't think. And so our notion of protagonism and the kinds of, the kinds of things an exhibit might do to promote increased protagonism uh, are really what we're working with now. So, we know what exhibit components from the cyber lab setup really promote this kind of active protagonism in learning. What's the role of explainers or educators or docents, the people who are actually mediating the interaction with the exhibit often and with the ideas often? I hate auto advance. Uh, what's the role of them in learning? To address that, we set up two projects in, uh, in Brazil. One is this, uh, Aventure Pelo Corpo Romano, uh, which is a, a traveling exhibit. It uh, has eight com exhibit components. This is two of them. The giant operation game, which is cool, and the giant nose. And so you walk through the nose, and it's full of cilia and all kinds of cool, gross stuff, uh, as is this, full of all these organs. And you can see the mediator clearly here. There's a mediator clearly back up there. Uh, we're doing this work in Brazil for, for several reasons, one of which is our great partnerships there, but another is, and their willingness to kind of try to try this out. Another is that 
unlike the U.S., where a lot of times you can just ignore the docents or the visitor or the volunteers or the mediators as you go through, uh, it, it's harder to do in the Brazilian context because mediation and mediators, explainers, like in Europe, like in a lot of the world, other than the U.S., are more or less a, a standard feature. And so you very rarely have an exhibit experience that's not mediated by docent. But so it's a great opportunity to study both. We're also doing work there. What's cool is we've been able to do work both with uh, youth groups like this, peer uh, uh, young people, but also teenagers. And there's almost no research on adolescents as learners in the United States or Europe. And so anywhere, actually, it's very little. And so we're, we're using this, this work also to crack into that audience and really understand the adolescent learning brain. Why? 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 How many of you live with an adolescent or have lived with an adolescent or were an adolescent? <laughs> yeah. They, I don't know. They're just hard to do research with. When you catch them, it's hard to get them away from their parents to do research with because when they're not with their parents, they're kind of like wild animals. And when they're with their parents, they act more like kids, children, than they act like themselves. But, or I don't know exactly, but it's very difficult to uh, to get them. It's hard to get their consent. Well, it's not. It's actually not hard to get their consent for research, but it's hard to get your Human Studies Ethics Board to understand, to believe that adolescents can give consent for their for research. Those kinds of things. Uh, I think that's part of it. I think also uh, the the history of developmental psychology has focused so heavily on early childhood education and development and sort of assume that the adolescents just stop developing in an interesting way. Uh, and we know that's not true now, but the, but the years and years of developmental psychology haven't caught up to that. So we just have a bias. Um, so this is one of the exhibits that, that we've been looking at. Uh, it's free. It travels around. The data that we specifically looked at came from a city about uh, 200 kilometers north of Rio. It's kind of a small, uh, smaller city. Uh, and school groups as they went through the exhibit. The second place that this work is being carried out is at Maloca, which is the sort of premier science museum in Colombia. Uh, it's right in Bogota, right downtown, as you can see. Uh, and it's a big, open kind of science museum, a more traditional science museum, not a marine science focus or a health science focus, but uh, astronomy, physics, perception, uh, human body, uh, uh, the history of science, uh, paleontology, uh, more like OMSI, a place sort of like OMSI with the same kinds of experiences there. Uh, and then the third place we've done this data collection is at Fia Cruz itself. This is uh, the Oswaldo Cruz house. Oswaldo Cruz, does anybody know who Oswaldo Cruz was? He was a philanthropist and amateur uh, scientist who became a doctor and really led the first wave of thinking in Brazil about uh, um, uh, uh, tropical diseases. And, and he, as a progressive of the, of the late 19th century, he, he honestly believed that we could eradicate all tropical diseases with the right kind of programming and education and created this foundation, which is now the equivalent of the CDC in Brazil. And the house, which is mainly offices for the university, uh, also has a kind of public exhibition space, which is much more dull and not quite interesting like this, uh, very informative, but also very typical of a museum exhibit. And a lot of adolescents go through there, so we're able to use this as a third site for doing this data collection. In all these cases, we are putting cyber lab cameras on visitors, on kids, as they're moving through exhibits, and then also mounting uh, cameras around the exhibit areas so that you can see the general movement patterns. <clears throat> Okay, so the answer to the question, do, does it matter? What, what, what impact do, do docents have on the exhibit experiences? It depends on the strategies. It really depends. So we took that data set, looked at all the examples of explainer-visitor interactions and visitor-visitor interactions with youth, they, they're all ages 6 to 16 in these exhibit areas, 25,000 individual interactions in the data set. So we're literally looking at, it's not, it's not a huge number of individual people, but it's a huge number of interactions. And this is where CyberLab comes in. A study like, three studies like this 10 years ago would have, would have maybe detailed 1,000 interactions at most, if that many. Uh, so this is really where we've made some, some headway. And so what you see across that data is very clearly that exhibit mediators make a big difference. 
So if an explainer kind of takes the role of what we call in my, in my class, sage on the stage, and focuses on delivering information to visitors, that that's their job, or focusing on accuracy of, you know, of what people are learning or knowing or doing, uh, that they, if they demonstrate without asking visitors to participate, or if they, if they sort of enforce doing the exhibit in a particular way by sort of policing the exhibit, um, that, what that leads to is a kind of monologue where they're doing all the talking. Uh, and visitors are not collaborating, they're not talking with each other, they're not interacting with the exhibit, and learning just doesn't happen. So you can have a perfect exhibit that has all the features. In fact, we've shown this empirically now. You have an exhibit that has all the features to promote interaction when you just have two visitors there interacting, and you get the wrong docent in there, <laughs> or a docent, the right docent doing the wrong thing, and it all sort of falls apart. If they use these kinds of strategies, on the other hand, asking visitors questions, encouraging visitors to ask their own questions, encouraging visitors to explore in open-ended ways that looks very similar to the, to the other list, introducing scientific content or language, but doing it as a hypothesis or a question or an observation instead of a fact, uh, and connecting to visitors' values. You can literally see this in the data happening. Uh, then what you get are, are, are things that you don't see when you simply have visitors interacting. So you see, when visitors interact in, these, in most of these cases, they're very often a very surface level interaction, especially surface level conversations about the content. And when a docent comes in and is doing these things, and there's about eight specific concrete strategies we identified in that data set that promote this, um, when they do those things, visitors start to make hypotheses, they start to argue with evidence instead of out of their own just made up ideas. They start to observe differently and more carefully. They start to interact and ask each other questions in a different way. All the hallmarks of beginning to think like a scientist or be disposed to see the world in a more scientific manner start to emerge when this happens. This is maybe not a huge surprise because research on classroom teaching has basically shown the same thing for years and years. Uh, we just haven't looked much at outside of classrooms at this. Any questions about that or this distinction? Yeah. Can you give a really specific example of that? Yes. Uh, I, I'm thinking about a, uh, there's a, um, <clears throat> let me get, let's see if I can give one for this, introducing scientific content or language as hypothesis or observation. Um, there's a case with the, where two students have, they've been looking at an exhibit on uh, um, gravity on Mars, right, and they, or, or gravity on different planets, and it's a scale, and you can stand on it and it shows your mass, right, on different planets. And so they, they're, they're talking about it, they're having this conversation about it, but the conversation is basically just a making fun of each other. Right? Oh, you're so fat on that planet. You're so, you're so skinny on that planet. Oh, yeah, I can pick you up over there. Right? They're, it's just a, it's just a game for them. Right? Kind of an opportunity to have a game to tease, to have fun, to engage with each other. Uh, when the when the docent comes up and actually introduces the idea of mass, that this is not about your weight, but this is about your mass, then the students themselves, and he doesn't say, hey, this is about mass, get it together. Right? <laughs> what he says is. Uh, what do you think staying the same, you know, as you as you move from one planet to the other? And they kind of they kind of toss out some ideas, and and he brings in kind of slowly in a very conversational way this notion of mass, and asks them if that's something that they have ever thought about or learned about in school. And of course they have, and so they, so these are teenagers, so they start talking about that, and they start reasoning about what might be happening. Right. So here's the docent in a kind of gentle way, nudging them toward a conversation that's more uh, accurate and more scientific uh, uh, without kind of coming in and, and enforcing a particular way of doing the exhibit or just providing information, providing the answer. Yes? In these other countries, uh, you had mentioned that docents are like very um, much a part of yes. the exhibit. Like here. Yeah. Are they also volunteers there? Do they go through more training and are actual employees? Yeah, most of them are employees, not volunteers. I don't think any of the uh, any of the docents any of the in any of our data were volunteers. They're all paid staff. Uh, I, uh, uh, all the ones in the uh, uh, in the uh, Aventuras in the body exhibit were pre-service teachers. 
who are being paid to be trained and work in the museum as part of their education. So, but they are they are professionals in that sense. Does that make a difference? Uh, we have a really great study done here on our volunteers, uh, which basically shows that um, even though they don't have the same kind of pedagogical training or, or kind of engagement training, they employ almost the exact strategies, same strategies. And across even at a place like Hatfield, where, where we have a huge, really fantastic volunteer population, many of whom have been doing it for many years, you also get this whole range Right, of people who are more comfortable doing this kind of thing and people who are more comfortable doing this kind of thing. And nobody's teaching them how to do it. <laughs> uh, there's a disposition, that's interesting in and of itself and problematic. Uh, so how do you sort of get people toward this end who aren't naturally there? There was another hand up. You answer my question. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Is there any impact? Yes, there is, and most of that research, well, diverse, diverse, okay, let me back up. Yes, there is in terms of diversity uh, according to age, cultural diversity, linguistic diversity. Uh, most of that work has been done with youth explainers in places like New York Hall of Science, the uh, Exploratorium in San Francisco, uh, and the Shed Aquarium. Uh, and so there is, uh, and it, it mirrors very much the, the research on peer mentoring in higher education or near peer mentoring, which is that uh, youth in particular often, often engage more deeply with other youth than with adults. Right? And so that's part of it. Uh, linguistically, when people look at this in terms of language, what you see is that the, the, real, the, real, the real payoff is not the actual translation or interpretation into a first language from a second language. It's in the cultural mindsets that come with language and in aligning cultural mindsets and expectations about the museum and about science and about uh, families more than it is about translating the information in a sign or something like that. So when you think about diversity and mediators or docents, you can think about it in terms of this kind of age level. You can think about it in terms of language or culture or ethnicity. Or you can think about it in terms of style. Right? And I want to make clear, I think I want, one thing I want to do make clear here uh, is that when we see this, it's not that this is always bad. Right? And it's not that this is always good. Because one of the things you see is that sometimes when a docent's all the way over here, it can literally just send the kids off track completely, very quickly. Uh, and sometimes when you're, sometimes you need this or want this, especially as a family visiting a museum, sometimes you, you need to know what to do in order to do it yourself before you just jump in and start doing it. Or you, or you need to know the name of that animal before you can have a useful conversation with each other about conservation of that animal. If you're not sure that's an animal, if you think it's a plant <laughs> or not even a living thing, in the case of the touch tanks, often your conversation about conservation isn't going to get off the ground if you think those are all rocks. Uh, and so there is, there's a place where delivering accurate information is absolutely crucial. Uh, but it does inhibit interaction with the exhibit, which is also not always a bad thing. This is descriptive research, not prescriptive research. I should have said that from the beginning. Anything else about that? Yeah. yeah. yeah just, um, with the docent program, though, wouldn't, wouldn't this be advantageous to present that to docents who are being trained? That Absolutely. These are two different things and want to integrate them? Absolutely. And thinking about the actual strategies that exist here and here and how you can incorporate them and how you can learn to know when is the right time to incorporate which. Absolutely. That would be a fantastic thing to do. We have not done that yet. This is, this is from two papers that, have, that came out this summer. And so I think one of our next steps will, will be trying to turn those into recommendations for training or teaching or uh, re research with volunteers more, more specifically. Yeah. Uh, the question was, uh, uh, if, these are, if these are both useful, this monologic and dialogic side of the spectrum are both useful, isn't there some value in training are including that in docent training or volunteer uh, education and pedagogical techniques. Absolutely. And the trick is knowing when 
when to, when to lean on these and when to lean on these. And that we actually don't know really well yet, I think, is the other piece. That's where more research will be helpful. Yeah. Are there different ones that you'd want to look into for different cultures? Like, do some cultures value some more than others? Uh, it's an excellent question. I don't think we have enough data to say that. Uh, I know that we have that Susan is part of a project that's uh, that's looking at uh, at this piece right here uh, in a uh, and basically trying to recreate the work that was done that she did here in aquarium context in Rio uh, to see if you get the same kinds of things. You see if you get the same kinds of engagement with uh, visitor values and worldviews, and if you get the same kind of outcomes from that. So I think that's research that's happening now. We do know from earlier research that we did in touch tanks. That, uh, that predates the cyber lab stuff, that, um, that uh, the content of what happens here, especially the kinds of questions that you might promote are different for, say, uh, Mandarin-speaking families than English-speaking families uh, in the U.S. or in Taiwan. That was Michael Liu's research, for those of you who remember Michael. Great. Okay, so what about parents? So we got exhibits we got uh, that we did here. We've been working on uh, do uh, docents. Uh, by the way, I should also act, add to this: this research is now being. We've got I presented three of the sites. This research is also being done now. The data is being collected now in Buenos Aires, in Costa Rica, in uh, Peru, and in Mexico City. So hopefully, within another year, we'll have a lot of really good kind of cross-cultural data on on this setup right here. All right, so what about parents? Uh, in the US context, parents are omnipresent in museum experiences. 85% of people who come to visit a science museum visit as part of a multi-generational family group. Right? They're not, so we think about school kids overrunning the museum. School kids are about 15% of the users of museums nationwide. They're the smallest audience. Uh, they're an important audience, but they're the smallest audience. Uh, so what about parents? Because mostly when you visit a museum, you're with your parents or your grandparents. We're also doing that research. Uh, we've done a lot of it here, obviously. And we're doing the same thing with the CyberLab stuff in, uh, in these same contexts. So this is an exhibit called uh, Floresta de Sentidos, Forest of the Senses. And it's an exhibit about biodiversity in tropical rainforest. Uh, it was uh, a temporary exhibit installed in a very small museum in Duque de Caxias, which is a, the poorest, most violent suburb of Rio. Uh, it's one of the worst places to live in all of Brazil. And, uh, and yet we got massive turnout for the museum exhibit and for the value of the museum. And so this is research with families coming through this exhibit, which is aimed at younger kids. Uh, and as you can see, it's kind of an immersive environment uh, with, a, with kind of tasks. So the kids and parents start here, one of these screens, there's six of them, and it gives them a, a kind of a re, uh, uh, explorer's box, a research box. And they collect materials out of that box, which send them into the forest to find out things, come back and report that, and it's timed. You have a certain amount of time to do it. So somebody stays there, one of the family members stays there and kind of cheers you on while you run off into the forest to find out what you need to find out, to come back and enter that to proceed in the game. It's so quite a good exhibit kind of set up uh, and, uh, and really successful. The second exhibit that we've been, and this is data we're looking at right now. So the second exhibit is uh, at the uh, Museo da Vida in uh, at Fia Cruz again in Rio. And this is this, uh, uh, I have to say that this was probably inspired by our work here because our postdoc from here went back and this emerged from it. So uh, I think that uh, this beautiful oceans exhibit, which is down now, uh, it was also a temporary exhibit. And as you can see, it's also kind of an immersive environment that, uh, that uh, cover it, it, that is thematically oriented by uh, benthic layers, uh, focusing on both science, the kind of science of marine sciences, as well as biology and conservation topics. Um, this one was also one of our sites for doing this research with parents and families. In the first one, let me get back up and talk about these in a little more detail. In this one, what we're looking at, what we're, what we're beginning to see is that Parents and explainers who are often working side by side in this exhibit uh, usually have very different modes of communication with kids and therefore modes of kind of interaction with the exhibit. 
And what we're trying to understand is given these different ways of interacting and these different ways of communicating and different strategies for collaboration, are there different outcomes for learning? And we're literally just parsing through this data now. This is another one where we have almost 14,000 data points that we're working through. And in this case in particular, this, this predates, we haven't actually, run, we're doing all this one by hand because the data was collected at a time when we weren't uh, using our uh, 3VR data stuff. And so this, is, this one's kind of a slog uh, in many ways, but, uh, but, um, but we're seeing some interest, there are interesting patterns emerging there. Uh, for instance, um, uh, parents will usually defer to the volunteer, the docent. So parents will set up a whole way of doing the interaction. The kids will start off doing it, and the docent will walk in, and the parents automatically step out, right? Even though they're not expected to or encouraged to or asked to, they sort of defer to authority. And so the question, and not in a bad way or a good way, it just seems to be something that happens all the time. Uh, and so then the question becomes, well, what's, how does the docent then bring those parents back in as not just authorities, but or not even authorities, not as but as learners and as resources for the family as they make sense out of the experience. Because when they leave the museum, the docent's not going home with them, right? <laughs> so we're seeing, we're, we're doing that kind of work there. Uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the Exposición Lucianos, uh, what we are looking at is emotion. So from the get-go, when we, when we opened up work with the Cyber Lab here, and even before, uh, we know that uh, one of the things that comes out of a visit to Hatfield are these huge emotional experiences. So uh, Ruth and Kent aren't here today to see the talk, but, um, but I tell this story all the time because they moved here when they retired because they had come through here on a vacation day and they had come in and Ruth got to touch the octopus during the octopus feeding and interact with it. And on their way home, she told Kent, we're gonna retire in Newport. <laughs> And 20 years later, they did. And she came here to work. Right? They both came here to work. That emotional, that absolute emotional connection is something that happens out there every day. So it's just an extreme case, right? Kind of an ideal type, an ideal case. But it, you can try it yourself. Next time you're out there and they're doing an octopus feeding, just stop any random adult and ask them why they came today. And they'll tell you, oh, I came today because I brought my kids. And I like to bring them because when I was a kid, I came here and I got to touch the octopus. Or I remember the touch tanks. I remember the old touch tanks. My brother fell in. Right? They, they, these emotional connections are made that literally persist beyond all of our all of our other learning, and that we know almost nothing about. And so, and you know, big surprise, we have very few rubrics or techniques or analysis uh, uh, guides and tools for studying emotion in public settings and learning. Right? We all experience it. We all do it. We all understand it in some way. We have so few resources for doing research on this. And so the biggest part of this, probably the next publication coming out actually of the whole, the whole effort is trying to pull together uh, just a, a guide and a rubric and a code book for analyzing learning emotion as a part of learning in public exhibit spaces. All right, <clears throat> very quickly, what's next? Uh, just five minutes, if the slide advances. The promise of the, and this is a slide I gave to the NAML group when they were here. The promise of the mobile cyber lab is really that you can, you can do this. You can create networks of research, right? And this is familiar to a lot of you who work in ecological research anyway. But this notion that you can have a network of research sites that are all linked in some way and collecting different kinds of data but using the same kinds of tools uh, is really powerful. And we don't do that in education research currently anywhere. Uh, but it does allow you to address all these issues, which are, if you just do a, a content search on any of those things in uh, NSF uh, documents, you'll find that this is, this is the language of education at NSF right now. Uh, so understanding authenticity, understanding student success, ecologies of learning, landscapes of learning, place-based education requires you to get outside of your one place and do research. And these kinds of networked learning sites where we're doing research really allow us to do that. And one of the next things that, we're, that we'll be doing, and we are doing it, uh, frankly. We've got six countries wired up right now doing this. Uh, so this is kind of a direction for cyber learning, for free choice learning research like this. 
A second is this. Uh, that's an electrical system in a suburb of Rio. Um, that's a guy who got off the airplane and, oops, that happened. Broke that. And this is a guy in Corvallis with his dogs. Can I go back and show you those again? Because I'm sorry, they, they kind of go fast. Uh, water system, electrical system that works, I should say, really well. Uh, look at this set up here. How the hell do people learn how to do that? These are under-resourced communities. These are people with nothing who are making everything. They're making do. They make do. And there's a set of dispositions. And then this is Watch the Shores work. There's a set of dispositions and observational routines and thinking routines and skills and techniques and knowledge that are necessary to do what these people do on a daily basis. And my belief, and I'm where our lab is going with, the, some, with our partners now, is that those are skills that promote sustainable relationships. So if you're thinking about sustainable economies, if you're thinking about economies of scale that have to change, if you're thinking about sustainable relationships with nature, uh, or if you're thinking about sustainable relationships among communities and cultures, there's a set of skills here that we absolutely devalue at the university. We don't teach them. We actively devalue them by excluding these communities from the conversation. And we don't have to. These, these techniques, these skills, these things, the things that keep cars running, you know, 1950s Chevys running on turkey basters in Cuba, uh, and it's not just cars. Uh, I was just talking to a researcher from Cuba the other day who basically pointed out, yeah, the entire, the entire healthcare system is running this way in Cuba. Right? 60 years of embargo, you make do. We're really interested in this. I was talking to uh, Peter Ruggiero. He says, guess who the most resilient community in Newport is in the face of an earthquake and tsunami? Anybody want to guess? Who's going to bounce back the fastest? The homeless and houseless community. Because they're already making do and they know how to do it. And they know what counts as a resource and what doesn't and how to put it to work. Why aren't those people seen as STEM education learning resources? So that's what we're that's what we're moving toward and working on now, taking the cyber lab tools out to these communities, to the net makers, to onboard boats, uh, to the bicycle co-op in Corvallis where they build bikes out of just stuff people bring in, uh, to homeless camps, and recording how people do what they do, and opening the doors of labs at the university like the new iLab, right there. <laughs> or the Advanced Wood Products Lab on campus, or the maker spaces on campus, to tribal artists, to quilters, to fishers, to car mechanics, recording what they do and seeing what they can teach undergraduates how to do. Right? To me, that's really, that's really a way of thinking differently about why STEM, why informal STEM matters. And we're going to take the, the tools and the lessons that we've learned so far and try to do that next. If you want to know more about that, I'm giving a talk on that, a really detailed talk on that, on February 4th at 10 a.m. at the Sea Grant Coffee with Colleagues. It's a completely virtual thing, so you don't have to show up. You can just listen in. Uh, but you can look that up. If you have other questions, you can check out our soon-to-be-defunct website, uh, which will hopefully direct you to a <laughs> newer, newer and better one. Uh, and with that, I will stop and take a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Maybe you guys got all your questions asked already. Yeah, John. Well, uh, two questions. One is that the, the uh, you know, very formal setting for the museums you're talking about, the exhibits and things like that. Do you have any way of I don't know, comparing that to kids that go out on the mud flat and just horse around? Yeah, uh, very few. Uh, we, um, this is another place where we would like to put this, the cyber lab stuff to work and with the mobile cyber lab stuff to work. We just haven't much uh, because we just haven't had found the right partners to do it. Um, but uh, um, I studied, I did a, I did a video based project before I came to Oregon with Girl Scouts in the forest as they were going around uh, identifying trees basically for a badge. Uh, and that context is 100% couldn't be more different than in the museum. We think about the museum as an informal learning site, but John very rightly used the word formal. It is. It's a designed place for learning. It's a curriculum, uh, just like school is. And so it's informal in one way. It's not, you're not being certified. 
uh, by going through the museum, but you, uh, but it's it's highly constrained. And the kind of context where kids play uh, and learn from play, improvisational play in particular, uh, are really powerful contexts. And no, we don't have a lot of research on that. And what research there is is done at um, a place like the University of Chicago, where they've done a they have a, they have a lab that does work on improvisational play. That's exactly what they they call it. Uh, and they also work with jazz musicians, right? So how do adults engage in improvisational play? How do kids engage in improvisational play? Where do they learn to do that? And what are the skills that come out of that? My hunch is, and I think that's why you're asking, that when you're talking about these kinds of ex these kinds of these kinds of things, that a lot of that looks more like improvisation and play. And I, I absolutely agree. I think that probably is the case. And that's one of the exciting things about, about this is you, we're freeing ourselves from the museum walls, but doing the same kinds of techniques. So we've done some nice R&D in the museum. Now we're going to take that out and see what we can learn in really in the wild, cognition in the wild. So the second part of it is that there's this how do things work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the question is, uh, there's this issue of how do things work? And how, even when John was in, uh, in a physics class in college, nobody ever took it apart and showed him how it worked. Uh, I mean, you, never, you don't even know how a microscope works unless you have to have that as your lab tech job as a graduate student. Uh, yeah, I, that's, that's a huge thing. And the stuff that, that, that we work with every day, we take for granted and it breaks. Uh, and we throw it away and we get another one. Or we, or we, and usually, <laughs> or we give it to somebody else to fix. Uh, I was talking to a friend uh, last night from India uh, uh, who said, I know what you're talking about. He's like, try to ride a motorcycle across India and stop everywhere to try to get it fixed. And he says, you'll, you'll get all the data you need right, and want. Uh, because when you have, when you, when you have no resources uh, and, or, or, you're, or you're dealing with the rest of the world's junk, you find ways to make things work that are different. Uh, and and the skill set that involved with that it it's a cool skill set to have right for engineers and things like that there's some value just in that but I think what we what a, 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 a nice research program could show is the link between that and the mindsets that are necessary for really sustainable living and sustainability environmental sustainability and so I think there's a link there that needs to be made that we haven't caught yet. Yeah, here in the so do you do you break up the learning in terms of because uh, getting back to your comment about the mud flats, like there's some things that you can learn about by just horsing around, but there's like processes or yep. like specifics about that. So how how do you break those two things up? Because it seems like here you can give a lot more in depth about processes or interactions yep. where you can't. It's not yep. like tinkering to find out. Yep. Sorry, I should I have a slide on that which I should have added on to the end here. Um, when we think about learning, uh, we, we tend to think about learning as a kind of monolithic thing, which is the acquisition of information or the mastery of skills. And we kind of stop there usually. Uh, but really, when you think about learning, it's, the, it's really the internalization of thinking routines, skills, knowledge, content, uh, and then the, the skillful manipulation of those things into a conceptual structure. right? And and what you're pointing out, I think, is absolutely accurate, and we do make that distinction in most of our work, is that there's, there are some cases where the interaction, where the teaching and learning interaction is about the mastery of content knowledge. Uh, and most of what you do here at the university is that. But then you all work in a lab, too. And in the lab, it's really about the appropriation of standard operating procedures and maybe the understanding of why you do those things, right? the conceptual strength framework underneath that. Each of those is learned in a different way and requires a different kind of teaching and instruction. Um, I, I, turning kids loose to play is super important. They will never play enough to generate basic algebraic laws. Right? Culture helps us with that. <laughs> and those things have to be taught. You'll never, you'll never generate those on your own. Right? They literally have to be taught. And they have to be taught in a more or less didactic, direct instruction way. Uh, because that's how we internalize culture. That's how we learn cultural norms and culture cultural facts and cultural practices. We internalize them. We don't really know them until we go out and use them in some meaningful activity. And so I think what's interesting about these kinds of places, bringing communities into the museum or into the university and going the university out into communities, you get the opportunity to see 
where the strengths of each of those come together in promoting learning, right? So where the strengths of didactic, we know how to do didactic instruction at the university really well. Uh, and we know how to force you to accept it <laughs> really well. And communities don't accept that kind of teaching and learning. They know how to do it other ways. Uh, and both of them are, are valuable, right? And for different kinds of things, which I think is what you're getting at. Yeah, we try to really take careful, one of, that, one of the things that means is that there's no, there's no one test that you can run across every context that shows that it's a valuable learning context. You really have to be attuned to what kinds of things might be learned here and what kinds of things might not be learned here. Yeah. There was another hand in red right there. I was thinking about collaborative learning between like calling uh, people that are you know, electricians or work on motors into the conversation. Do you think there's value for them of like, let's say, Yeah, I think, uh, I don't know exactly, but I think from other work that people are doing around the country that, that that's a really crucial component of it is that there has to be mutual benefit, right? So if you're just bringing, if you're just bringing, you know, electricians into campus to work with, uh, with physics classes um, and it's really just about them as a resource, and all their knowledge gets sucked up into the classroom and then they get shot out the other end as, with a thank you, that's not, they're not gonna do it again. <laughs> it's not really beneficial to them. So there really has to be some benefit and, and identifying what that is is really crucial. And I think that requires going out and asking them, but also they don't know. That's the problem, you can't just go out and ask them, what benefit would you have from coming over to campus and working in the lab? Uh, you, you, you almost need to create these contexts where there's enough trust and, uh, and engagement around something that's nobody's really the expert on, uh, where people can actually learn to work together and then begin to see. That's how we set up extension programs. I think you almost need to do the same thing for these kinds of research and teaching efforts, too. So people are coming in and uh, on a more or less level playing field and starting to see, oh yeah, Joe Haxel has some real interesting skill that I can put to work here in my daily life. And oh, I have this that they can actually I just solved that problem for them. So it really does have to be that two-way communication, which is, which is that, if you go back to that slide, that's the, I'm gonna use that cool thing Cinema showed me. Uh, the, uh, that's really the dialogic side of it, right? Where, where, where the conversation is two-way, where authority is shared, and where you're not, you're not dealing with these sort of hierarchical, top-down, me-to-you teaching, but there's literally this, Side to side teaching, and there's a there's a good bit of research on that, but not a lot of it's super accessible. So it'd be interesting to try it here. Any other questions? Yes. You talked just briefly about um, a project coming to the iLab. Can you tell me a little bit more about it? Yeah. So I think what we would like to do in places like the iLab is literally is literally that. Um, uh, we would like to go out, so let's take Sarah's shop, take the netmaker as an example. Um, net making is an extraordinarily complicated, complex thing uh, and skill set. And problem solving is, a, is an absolute everyday part of it. Uh, and thinking on the fly and making decisions on the fly and uh, rousting up materials on the fly is, is absolutely a part of it. Uh, it would be, what we would like to do is to go into places like that with CyberLab set up, record how that works, come back, look at that, think about it carefully, and then invite the net makers into places like the iLab where the resources at their disposal are enormously greater than what they have there, put their hands on in their shops. And not exactly turn them loose uh, to see what they can do with it, but give them some, some problems and tasks to solve in that context and teach students, faculty, researchers, the techniques that we've seen them use in their sites. So it's really that kind of modeling, come into a new site where, where the university is pumping resources uh, and, uh, and see how your, your resource-strapped decision-making and problem-solving skills work in that context and what people who are used to working with resources, a lot of them, uh, can learn from that and how that changes what they do, but also changes the products. What gets made 
because there's another piece of this, the things that get made out of those collaborations, we think will be very different. So that's the kind of thing. We we're already talking with the Bicycle Cooperative in Corvallis about uh, um, bringing in uh, the uh, members of the cooperative, uh, members of the Homeless Bicycle Coalition, and um, uh, to the Maker Fair to do some activities in the Maker Fair context with some of the materials that HP provides. Equipment that nobody can put their hands on outside of a lab at HP for the same purpose. To kind of see, you can build a better bike with that stuff. We'll just print it. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you all for coming, and uh, I'm glad to answer any questions via email or in the future. I see most of you some of the time. So.